Hello, and welcome to the supplemental lecture on conductive heat flow and entropy, two topics within thermodynamics, both highlighting particular applications of calculus. All right, so let's get started with the first topic, conductive heat flow. So our objectives here are to view the expression of conductive heat flow, which is power, joules per second, or watts, as the first time derivative of heat, okay? So that's a calculus view of um, basically um, conductive power. We're then going to use the derivative expression of heat flow to set up an integral that allows for solution of the time required for heat flowing through material that has a thickness that itself is a function of time, okay? Because it's that, that same issue that we call a differential equation, where you've got a derivative and the variable itself in a single equation, okay? It's a simple differential equation where we can essentially treat the derivatives like fractions, and you'll see the solution technique, and then we just solve with direct integration, okay? All right, but let's look at our one key physics formula. So H um, stands for the conductive heat flow. Again, when it's, it's power to have units of watts, all right? And it's equal to dq over dt, or excuse me, dq over dt. dt is the time derivative of heat. Well, the whole thing, dq over dt is the time derivative of heat, okay? So it's the derivative of heat with respect to time. And of heat is q, okay? And then k is the coefficient of conductivity. It's a material-specific value that tells you how well heat can flow through a substance. It's one of, one of the two algebraic expressions for heat flow, the other being the one that describes radiative heat flow. In that case, you need to know the surface area of the object that's radiating energy away as light. But here you need to know the cross-sectional area and the thickness of whatever the heat is flowing through because conduction makes sense when heat is flowing through something like the surface, in this case, the surface of ice. A is the cross-sectional area. T or H is the thickness of the conductive material, okay? And then delta T, uppercase T, is the change in temperature. So it'd be T outside as compared to T inside, okay? It's, your, it's, the, it's the positive temperature flow. It's the, it's the higher temperature minus the lower temperature because it's the, if, we're, if we're interested in heat flowing in that direction from high to low, okay? All right, so now let's look at an example that has all those types of values and then has a thickness that itself is a function of time, okay? And the natural case, the natural way that that would show up, a very common situation, is a lake freezing over because as a, as a liquid starts to freeze, as water starts to freeze, it develops ice on the surface. Now, more water wants to freeze underneath that ice, but in order to do so, it needs to lose heat into the air, which means the heat needs to flow through the ice and then radiate away from the surface of the ice. But the heat must flow through the ice, right? So then as more water freezes underneath the ice, you have subsequent layers of ice essentially developing. And so you could think of one layer and a layer. As more and more layers develop, the water underneath will continue to freeze, but in doing so, it now has to flow through more ice, which actually slows down the rate of freezing. So the initial freezing takes less time than subsequent layers of freezing. But of course, thinking of ice freezing in distinct layers isn't correct. It's a continual process. Hence, it requires this not just summing up layers and saying that a layer takes a certain amount of time, but instead integrating over infinitesimally thin layers and summing them. Okay? Okay? So here we have the picture. The air outside is maintained at negative 20 degrees Celsius. The water is right at the freezing point, so it's at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, it's not frozen yet. The thickness of the ice sheet is dH at any one time, right? That's gonna be, it's gonna change. The thickness will grow. The sheet has a mass of dm, and that's gonna be important because we're gonna think about um, basically the energy to freeze the entire quantity of ice itself, okay? And there's that cross-sectional area, A. And of course, there's going to be a coefficient of conduct conductivity, K, that's going to be material-specific, and we'd look it up in a table and find whatever the value is for ice. Okay, so the lake freezes over by the surface freezing and not the entire lake freezing at once. Of course, right? The thickness of the ice sheet forming on the surface of the lake grows with time as the heat of the fusion of the water, that's like latent heat of fusion of the water, freezing on the underside is conducted through the ice sheet. So, A, 
Assuming that the upper surface temperature is maintained at a constant negative 20 degrees Celsius and the bottom of the ice sheet is zero degrees Celsius, how long would it take for a sheet to form that is 20 centimeters thick? Which is a pretty thick, it's pretty thick ice, right? Okay, so we're gonna find the heat flow that flows through the growing sheet of ice that allows the next layer of thickness dh to freeze. Okay, all right, so let's think about that, okay? And by the way, this, this picture is re representing not the whole ice sheet that's growing, but just one layer that's growing at that particular moment in time with an infinitesimally small mass or a mass element and a thickness element, an infinitesimally th uh, thin thickness of dh, okay? And so there'd be a bunch more of these to form the overall h value, okay? Which is the current sum of the thickness of the ice. All right, so first we need to consider the change in heat, okay? And that's, you know, we've been focusing so much on the growing ice sheet, we don't want to forget that there's also a growing heat or a, a constant rate of changing heat. And that's how much energy it takes to freeze the next infinitesimally thin sheet of ice, which will be the mass of that sheet, the mass element dm, okay, the differential of mass, multiplied by the latent heat of fusion for water, okay? All right? All right, and then that, this comes from Q freezing being mass times latent heat of fusion. Okay, and then we can rewrite that mass element as a density times a volume. Okay, now the density is just the density of ice. Okay, you know because that's that's how much how much energy it took to freeze that much ice. Okay, and it's got to be the density of ice, not the density of water, because it's going to become part of the sheet. All right, so then if we want, so the way we need to consider it is it's once it's become ice. But dV that's the actual volume differential. That's the volume element. Okay. But then dV itself isn't quite the derivative we want because the cross-sectional area remains constant. So that means we're going to rewrite volume as thickness times area, right? And so then we pull out the constant A and now we're left with the, the differential we want, dH, okay? All right, and of course the latent heat of fusion is also a constant and we can maybe put that out, out um, to the left as well, okay? So now we're going to rewrite our expression, our actual wattage expression or our power expression. So conductive heat flow, conductive power equals the first time derivative of heat equals Ka delta T over H, okay? But now here's the rewrite, okay? So then we're going to multiply both sides by dT, okay? Why, why would we do that? Well, because we're going to have an H that's dependent on time, remember, okay? And then we're gonna replace dQ with this expression here, okay? And notice then it's got, it has a dH in it. Aha, we needed that, right? Because we know that H is a function of time, which means we need to have the dH over dt with H, okay? We need to have H and H dt together, okay? Or actually, really, we need to have H and dH together. We can leave the dt on the other side because then we can integrate this, okay? You're gonna see that in the next step, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to cross multiply by H, that's what I've done in this step here, which then brings it over to the left-hand side, which is the side with the rho cross-sectional area dH latent heat of fusion, okay? And then we're gonna integrate, we're just gonna integrate both sides, okay? Basically the way it looks right here. All right, so here it is, okay? So we're integrating the side that now has the H on it and also has a dH. Excellent, okay, it's got some constants. We're gonna integrate it from zero to H because initially there's no thickness of the ice sheet. By the time the ice sheet is done, it will have a thickness of H, okay? And look, we were told what kind of H we're gonna to integrate to. So we're gonna make H an actual number, just 20 centimeters, okay? We're in units and meters, so we're good to go. And then we're gonna integrate, integrate this one with respect to time. Now there's no T here, so this is just gonna become time. So this integral is very simple, okay? So then well, here we, I've just, I've just done, I've evaluated both integrals and there's, I don't show much of the evaluation steps because we're in, both of them have a lower limit of zero. They're both polynomials. This one be, becomes H squared or actually one half H squared. And this one just becomes T because a constant when you integrate it becomes T, okay? And so then this one, right? We pick up the one half. We have, we evaluate zero to H. So of course then H, H evaluated at H is just, you know, or H squared evaluated at H is just H squared. And here, I, here we have our T. All right, but what we have now is, is the one step before having a function. Because all I'm gonna do is just isolate H and now I really have the functional form that we derived ourselves just using a definition of the kind of how it makes sense. And that's the thing, you know, that's, there's, there's so many relationships like this 
that are just specific to physical phenomenon. That this may, this not isn't a, a maybe you know the formula we're going to look up isn't a common formula of you know oh here is the you know the time dependent thickness of a growing ice sheet. It's it makes sense to kind of be able to derive this based on the principles of physics and calculus. Okay, and so let's go ahead and get our function. All right, so solve for time t. Um, oh. I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I because I, I have versions. I and I think we'll do this in the next step. I was thinking of solving for h, right? But actually, we're going to solve for t instead because we, we were asked for to find the time and h is given. But if we wanted to find h and time was given, then you know we could then have a function. So either way, right? All right. So this is going to be t as a function of h, the time it takes for a particular thickness layer to go grow, which is also a pretty cool function. All right. So all I've done here is just isolate it. Notice one thing is I've actually expanded out delta t as t hot minus t cold, right? Okay. And, and again, it's always the hot minus the cold because we're looking for positive heat flow here. Okay, and then we'll plug in our value of 20 centimeters, okay, and in, in this form is point, point 0.2 meters. Okay, plug in all the other values, right? Here's the density of ice. Here is the latent heat of fusion. This is the, th the thickness that well, we're told to find the time for, all right? Which is uh, 20 centimeters, right? That's our, our variable squaring it. Our denominator is just two times. Here's the conductive heat flow constant for ice. All right. And then we have T hot, which is zero, right? It's so hot. But of course, that is significantly hotter than the, the surface temperature at negative 20. All right. And what do we get? 194,000 seconds, which is 54 hours. Okay. So a lot of time, but again, that's a very thick ice sheet, 20 centimeters, a fifth of a meter. Um, and and that might also, it might take longer in the real world because the, the outside temperature might vary. It might not just hold steady at negative 20 all day and all night, right? It's more likely in the day it would warm up a little bit and you kind of slow down. And so, you, you know, so you'd have to, I mean, the only, if you had, if you had, I guess if you had a function of the temperature, just, um, just quick, quick idea here, you know, if, if the temperature itself was time dependent, then that's okay because you could actually then just put it inside the, um, the integral for, for time. So then the, D, the dt integral would itself be, say, like a polynomial. So if you had, um, or it could be like a sine function, all right? So then you would just take, take the derivative of that sine function. The issue there is it would be hard to, it'd be harder. I know it'd be okay, because you could still solve for the time. You would just, this would just be some, uh, it'd be inside of an inverse sine function. If, if you, in that, because that would kind of be the natural idea if the temperature itself was, was sinusoidal varying between day and night, okay? All right. So part B, if the lake is 55 meters deep, how long would it take? So basically we're just gonna do it again, but we're gonna do it for a different thickness this time. All right, so use the same derived function, this one here, okay? And just plug in, um, instead of 20 centimeters, 55 meters, right, big difference, all right? And what do we get? Well, we get a, well, 14 billion seconds, okay? And that's 466 years. So this would like, you know, require, you know, some, this would be a, you know, a, I guess it gives you some idea. Like if you have, um, you know, maybe you have like a comet or something, you know, where a bunch of the surface um, became liquefied because it went close to the sun. And then if it then leaves the sun, that's how long it would take it for like the whole thing to refreeze like deep down in. Of course, the ambient temperature in that case could be much lower than negative 20. It could be maybe say negative 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. All right. So, but that's the idea using principles of calculus and physics to come up with equations for particular situations. This being a, one interesting example, all right? And the homework, I just ask you to do it again, all right? So same, same idea, um, and basically you're gonna do it for a different time. And then I do have a, a different follow-up question, part B, and that's what's the instantaneous rate of change after a certain amount of time? So that's, you have to think about how you're gonna, at that point it's just kind of rearranging the function and thinking about what I'm asking here, okay, all right? I can, I can, you know, we can talk about that if you're, if you're interested, but let's do the second half of this lecture, which is tied together because it's another thermodynamics idea. And I'd say also it's tied together mathematically because it's, um, <clears throat> it's dealing with this, this, these rates of change. Yeah. You know, these, these natural functional dependencies between rates of change, between instantaneous rates of change. Okay. In other words, it has to do with calculus. Um, so we have here our one key formula. What's we just, Get ahead, let's read the objective here. So we want to understand what is meant by the concept of entropy and how to calculate entropy for a system that does not remain at constant temperature, okay? Um, now, that might sound familiar because if you've 
all the entropy problems that, that you ever see in an algebra-based class of physics all involve constant temperature. They can involve phase changes, but they can't involve temperature changes unless we're going to estimate them with an average temperature. And the reason for that is because we have, we basically, we have a temperature that is changing, and as it changes, then that's going to change the rate at which entropy changes. So it's that, you know, it's that, that same sort of interdependency, okay? So this is what, what entropy looks like in its more formal definition, okay? So the change in entropy is delta S, S represents entropy, the delta represents change. Um, it is the measurement of the change of disorder. It has unit, units of joules per Kelvin, all right? And... We're going then to evaluate it from one state to another state, okay? And then what's going to be changing is the change in heat over T. But we're assuming that T, writing this as an integral is nice because it doesn't assume that T has to be constant. So this definition of entropy can work and can be applied when T is non-constant, okay? All right, where T, T is changing. All right, so that, that's, that's the setup, okay? And I know the limits of integration seem very um, vague, just state one to state two. That idea of talking about states is a common idea in thermodynamics as well as chemistry. You have state variables like pressure and volume and temperature and number of moles. Um, so that, that's kind of the idea here. Of course, we're gonna do a substitution when we actually solve the integral. All right, so let's look at our one example. So a two kilogram block of lead at 40 degrees Celsius is placed in a very large quantity of water, like a lake or something, that is at 10 degrees Celsius. After a few moments, thermal equilibrium is reached. And then what is the change in entropy of the lead with a specific heat of 310 joules per kilogram Kelvin? And what is the total change in entropy of the system? All right, great. So um, one thing about this one is this, there's actually one part of the system where the temperature is remaining constant, and that, and that is in the very large quantity of water. It, started, it starts at 10, it's gonna finish at 10. So I'll, I point out here, no cal calorimetry calculation is needed because the water is so massive. Now, I don't do that because we can't handle a problem that involves calorimetry. That would actually just be a, a perfectly fine initial first step. So you could do this with putting two kilogram, a two kilogram block of lead at 40 degrees Celsius in a 40 liter vat of water at 10 degrees Celsius. And then in that case, you just find the final temperature, right? And then you just have to do the integral twice. You do, you do an integral for the lead and an integral for the water. Here, we're actually only gonna to have to integrate for the lead and for the water, we can just use the form where we basically pull the temperature out of the integral and we just get that delta S is just dq over t because t is a constant, okay? All right, and so I, I guess I basically just did that so we don't have to integrate once just to illustrate the point and not get bogged down too many steps. All right, so let's do it. So we have that the, the equilibrium temperature is the same as the initial temperature of the water and it's 10 degrees Celsius, okay? So for the lead, what happens, okay? So we'll, we'll just use the general definition of entropy because we know that temperature is not going to remain constant, which I'm telling you is not require integration. Let's see what that means, what type of integration. Okay, zoom in a little bit on this. Okay, so here it is. Okay, L, L here is for lead. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the dq with mass times specific heat times change in temperature. Because that's, that's the case, right? That's what Q represents. Q for any, for any energy change of a substance that doesn't involve a phase change must involve a temperature change, and it always takes the form of m c delta t. Okay, but look here, it's an instantaneous delta um, change in temperature, so it's not delta t, it's dt. Okay, and look now we have an integral, right? Because we've got a differential and we've got a variable. Okay, and we're going to then define our limits more exactly as t initial to t final. Okay. Which, what are, they, what, what are they going to be? Well, T initial is going to be 40. And what's T final going to be? Well, it's going to be T equilibrium. It's going to be 10. All right? And so then when we actually do this integral, look at the, look at the antiderivative here. Right? So the, the form that the integral took was 1 over x dx, which then becomes what? Well, it becomes the natural log of x. Right? That's exactly what it is. Right? It's that, it's that well-known, famous integral. Okay? And so then we're gonna evaluate at the upper and the lower limit, okay? And we pull out the constants, okay? So when we do that, we end up evaluating our natural log at T final, 10 degrees Celsius, our natural log at T initial, okay? Constants in front, that's the mass of the lead and the specific heat of the lead. And then we use our law of logarithms to take the subtraction and turn it into division within the logarithm, which is just a much cleaner way of expressing it. And then we plug in our numbers, okay? Now notice though that it's very important since you're taking a ratio 
that you do, that you convert them to Kelvin because a ratio basically one over four is not the same as 283 over um, three, um, 313. Okay. So, you know, so it was very important that, you know, that you convert it over to Kelvin. This has to be done in Kelvin. Otherwise I've just plugged in the mass of the lead and the specific heat of the lead. And there we go. Okay. It's a negative value. And the reason you know it's going to be a negative value is because here you have and take, you're taking the natural log of something that's smaller than one, okay? Or I guess more importantly, something that's smaller than E, okay? And so that's why you're getting negative 62 joules per Kelvin, right? Again, that's, those are the units of entropy. So it's a negative value. Why? Because the lead lost entropy. The lead became more ordered because it went from a higher entropic state of being relatively warm lead at 40 degrees Celsius to cooler lead. And in doing so, it became more orderly. Its molecules were jiggling around less. Okay, so it, there was a loss of entropy from the lead. Okay, but there must be a gain of entropy in the lake. The lake must have gained entropy. And but you'd be wrong to say it's the same amount. There's no such thing. Entropy isn't some conserved quantity. Entropy, in fact, is is always increasing. It's always creeping up. And so when we calculate the change in entropy of the lake, it'll be greater than the negative 62 and positive. Okay, but let's show how to do that quickly. All right here, we don't, we don't need any calculus. All right, and so that's total change in entropy of the system. First, we need the lake. So the change in entropy of H2O it represents the water. By the way, because I never I, know, I never call it a lake. It's just a very large quantity of water. I'm just calling it a lake now. Okay, so our change in entropy of the water, all right, is going to be positive. It's going to be the mass of the of the um, basically it's the mass of the lead. I'll explain why. Mass of the lead, the specific heat of the lead, and the change in temperature, because this is just Q, okay? And this is how much energy is put into the lake. Well, the amount of energy that's put into the lake has to be the amount of energy that the lead lost, because energy is conserved, okay? Don't get confused here, right? Entropy is not conserved, but energy is, okay? So this is this, is this Q that is, that is being coming from the lead, QH, Q hot, right? But the temperature is definitely different. Right, and if we had used calorimetry, the temperature, then we do, you know, we'd have to do the calculus twice, and we get two different values. But here, it's just the, the lake is massive; it basically just stays fixed at um, 10 degrees Celsius. So then we're going to take Q divide by 283, and we get 65.7 joules per Kelvin. See, it has to be larger because we're dividing by a smaller value, okay? And it's just, or the natural log is 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 a is ends up being smaller. Than that, what we're dividing by. Okay, so then the sum or the total change in entropy of this event of putting the lead into the lake is just the sum of the two. So it's the it's the loss in entropy of the lead plus the gain in entropy of the large quantity of water, and the net change in entropy is three point two six joules per kelvin. Again, because entropy always goes up. But as we're really really seeing how the calculus can confirm that for a system where there actually is a temperature change, and you don't have to just take an average. Okay. For homework, you're going to do the same thing, um, except this time, it, it, it is going to involve an initial calorimetry step and two integrals. Because here, you're going to have a block of ice, okay? You're going to of, of a known mass and temperature, and then you're going to put it in a bucket of water. And then what is the change in entropy of the mixture once it reaches the equilibrium? Oh, actually, no, this one, you because you'll, 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 here you have the ice. If we'd started the ice at, say, like negative 10, then you would have to, um, you'd have to do entropy change for the warming ice, which would require an integral. But here you don't, because the ice actually starts right where it's ready to melt, at the temperature is ready to melt. So you won't, you won't need an integral for the ice. So that will be like almost, you know, like the large quantity of water. And the only thing that you will need to integrate is the fact that the water is going to cool off a little bit. Okay? But, and, and, but you will have to do calorimetry because you were given a fixed volume of water to find out how much the water cools, to find the final equilibrium temperature. So you're not given the equilibrium temperature in the homework problem. That part will require calorimetry, but still only one integral. Okay. All right. So I hope um, this, you know, this lecture on this handout has been, uh, has been interesting, seeing these two applications of calculus and thermodynamics. Um, and I hope it's been very informative. And thank you so much for watching.